Rockfish are really fascinating species because they are so long-lived. Many species can live over 200 years. Oftentimes rockfish aren't even able to reproduce until they're 20 or 30 years old. Uh, when they do start to reproduce, rockfish also uh, release live birth instead of eggs, which is fairly unique for a fish species. And those baby rockfish, when they're released, uh, will spend quite a bit of time in the water column before they head down to eelgrass beds. Eelgrass beds are really important for rockfish species because they provide both protection from predators and food in the form of small invertebrates that uh, live on the blades of the eelgrass. Then as the rockfish get a bit older, a few years later, they'll move into slightly deeper habitat and they'll find shelter and food in really important kelp reef environments. And kelp forests are another important step in the life cycle of rockfish. And then rockfish will move down into deeper habitat, rocky reef environments, and they'll often pick a single boulder site to live on for the rest of their lives. They particularly like sites with lots of cracks and crevices that they can hide in and they can spend the next 100 to 150 years depending on their species in those cracks and crevices. Rockfish are also very important socially because they're commercially fished and recreationally fished and fished by uh, food social and ceremonial fisheries for indigenous groups. So preserving them is very important for uh, BC communities as well. And biologically rockfish are very important because they play an important role in the middle of the ocean food web. They do a very good job of kind of maintaining the crustacean population and small invertebrate population so it doesn't uh, overrun eelgrass and kelp ecosystems. And then they play an important role as uh, food in keystone species diets, such as killer whales and stellar sea lions. They are really vulnerable to fishing pressure because they have a particular trait. They have a closed swim bladder, which basically means if you fish them and bring them to the surface, their stomach basically inflates and it makes them really difficult to do catch and release well with. So you try and release them, they try and swim back down, but they basically have an inflated balloon in their stomachs and can't swim down. So then even if the fishermen didn't want to catch that fish, uh, if they try to release it, they'll just float on the surface and they'll often get picked off by seals or eagles. Um, other species will just catch it off the surface. So this is called barotrauma and it's a major reason why rockfish are very vulnerable to fishing pressure. So there's a lot of different rockfish conservation efforts ongoing in BC right now. In 2002, uh, 162 rockfish conservation areas were created and those are all along the coast of BC. And they restrict almost all fishing. The only fishing allowed in those conservation areas is fishing that has been deemed low risk to rockfish, things like um, crab and prawn trapping. So those have been really instrumental in trying to protect, protect rockfish. And there have also been reductions in commercial catches that are allowed, which is really great because rockfish were particularly decimated in the 1980s when a large commercial fishery started for them. 
those conservation efforts have been really helpful, but rockfish are still uh, in need of more conservation, I would say. Currently, quillback and yellow eye rockfish are listed as threatened species by uh, Kosuik. In terms of making rockfish conservation areas more effective, it's been suggested that some small rockfish conservation areas be enlarged to capture all the different habitats needed for the life cycle of a rockfish. For example, you want a rockfish conservation area to have access to eelgrass beds, kelp beds, and then all the way down into the deep waters of a rocky reef so that as a fish is born, it can live in a protected area in the eelgrass, move into a protected kelp forest, and then move into a protected rocky reef area. And they're also trying to work on creating better connectivity between rockfish conservation areas so that if a rockfish does swim out of a protected area, it's not kind of trapped in a no man's land where it can get fished out. Hopefully it can keep swimming, find another appropriate habitat. Any time you go in the water on the coast of British Columbia, there's rockfish. No matter what habitat you're diving in, no matter what depth you're diving in, there will be, if not like direct rockfish, things that the rockfish rely on or the things that rely on rockfish. So it's one of those keystone species on the whole coast. They're the food for everything and they also eat everything. Uh, everything relies on rockfish to be there and it's like the the theme that ties all these different other events, the salmon returns and the herring returns and everything. Rockfish are kind of the common thread throughout the whole year. Scuba diving and breathing are kind of synonymous with each other, but some fish don't like that sound. They're really sensitive to sounds. So if you exhale when you're trying to approach, like let's say a China rockfish, they'll freak out and they'll go and hide in their cave and you won't get a photo and you won't get a size estimate and the whole survey's a bust. So some species don't mind if you breathe as long as you don't move. Some species don't mind if you move as long as you don't breathe. Some are really sensitive to light. Rockfish fisheries will target pelagic rockfish and do midwater trawls. Like you're allowed to midwater trawl within a rockfish conservation area. There are these massive schools of like 30 to 50,000 fish. Every once in a while when we're diving, we'll be lucky enough to hit one of these. And that's one of the hardest things to quantify within a transect, is this moving, swirling school of 50,000 fish. It's hard not to have it take your breath away when you're underwater and you're trying to be a scientist and do a good job and survey what's there. And this huge cloud of fish come and just blot out the sun. One of the predominant predators for rockfish, specifically like smaller rockfish, are lingcod. And lingcod do this by being really aggressive and by like sitting on ledges overlooking an area. And they'll feed on these mega schools, they'll feed on the juveniles. Once you reach a certain size, you're safe of the lingcod predation. You're basically, once a rockfish is big enough, nothing can really eat them short of like an orca or a human. They have these big venomous spines on them. So rockfish, sebastes are related to lionfish. These like really venomous fish that if you get poked, it hurts. I wouldn't want to be poked by them, but it's not going to kill you. It's not lethal. Uh, elephant seal washed ashore here, a, a big male elephant seal, and they did a, a necropsy, and it turns out that it tried to eat a quillback rockfish. And the rockfish put his spines up in the elephant seal's throat, and that killed this five meter long elephant seal, this single quillback trying to eat it the wrong way. There's been recordings, we know rockfish vocalize, but wouldn't it be cool if we know which species made what noises? We went out and put hydrophones and rockfish will drum, so they have a swim bladder and they have a, a bone essentially that sits on the swim bladder and they'll drum on their swim bladder and that's how they make vocalizations. We were talking about how sensitive they are to sound and bubbles and things, but they can also talk to each other. When you're diving, if you, you know, hold your breath and listen for it, you can actually hear when a rockfish is grunting at you. You can hear it, but you can also see the rockfish's quills.
looking at where the community knows the fish are, where are important fishing spots for each of these First Nations communities, comparing the implemented RCAs with where the fishermen know the fish are, and measuring the different sizes between them, and then coming up with a plan for how to protect the important areas, but still allow for a lot of fishing. Uh, you still want commercial fishery to take place. There are First Nations fishermen who are, participate in the commercial fishery. And they don't want it to be shut down. Um, recreational fishing still has a role on the Central Coast, whether it's through lodges or just through locals who want to fish. So the, that's the goal is, is you don't want to just say moratorium, no one's allowed to fish any rockfish because then you don't get, if you don't know about them, then you don't care. And if you're not invested in them, whether it's as a, a food source or as something that I just like to dive with or take pretty photos of, uh, then it's really hard to get engagement. And fishermen are often the most passionate conservationists. They're the ones that want to make sure there's big yellow eye that their kids can catch. It's heartening to me to see the, the change of the coast as First Nations communities get given the right of way to manage their territories their understanding of how complex these marine environments are are really going to pave the way forward for effective management. You can't say this is the pinnacle that's worth protecting unless you fished it or dove it or seen what's down there yourself. And there's just too much of this coast for people to come in on a, a research boat and to do that everywhere. So we've done it where the nations have directed us and that's really changed the understanding of rockfish on the central coast. And I'm excited to see that spread to the rest of the coast of British Columbia. But as we learn more and more about these areas and these fish and really where they spend their time and what they do, then that'll allow us to like put up these effective marine protected areas that'll allow these fish to continue. And if you have an abundant rockfish population, then you can have a healthy ecosystem. They're that that keystone that keeps it all together. They're here year round. They live hundreds and hundreds of years. A lot of these fish that we catch are older than Canada. And it's just like a nice reminder that if you can keep a few of those, then, you know, my grandkids will get to catch rockfish too.
Thank <laughs> you.